good afternoon or good morning or wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the Buck Institute for Education's webinar on critical thinking and project-based learning with our guest presenter, Roland Case from the Critical Thinking Consortium uh, in British Columbia, Canada. So welcome everyone. You'll notice the chat feature to your right where you can pose questions, which we will answer uh, during or just after the end of Roland's presentation. Uh, you're free to use that as you wish and offer resources or ask questions of us. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Roland. Thank you, Roland. Well, thank you, John. Um, it's a delight to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm the executive director of the Critical Thinking Consortium. Uh, like the Buck Institute, we're a nonprofit organization with a single-minded purpose. Uh, in our case, it's to promote rigorous and thoughtful uh, thinking, critical thinking, throughout the curriculum. Uh, and I'm just delighted to have this opportunity to be speaking to you. Uh, the, the focus of today, uh, and let me just move this aside for a moment, is the idea of embedding critical thinking into everything we do. So the driving question to, to use a, a very effective strategy that the Buck Institute uses is what, what is the question that's going to drive our inquiry is, could I actually embed rigorous critical thinking into every lesson of my next PBL unit? And I think there are two parts to this question. Can I do it regularly? And can I do rigorous critical thinking regularly? So we've asked uh, each of you to answer this question, in, and we've given you four choices. So one of four choices. Uh, I can see that we have uh, 19 of you, and there's lots of movement back and forth. So we have 21 uh, people who have uh, voted. Let's just wait a moment, perhaps, for others, uh, uh, and then we'll publish uh, these results. So we have 22 of you thus far. But mostly I want you to think about the, this uh, as a sort of question to reflect in your own mind. To what extent is critical thinking something that we can actually make an ongoing and um, inevitable uh, part of almost all of the teaching we do? Um, so I think we'll sort of call the vote to an end. So let me see if this, um, whoops, who said that I pretty much do this now, and 50% of you said, I think it's possible, but I can't seem to do it regularly. And wonderfully, thankfully, no one thought it wasn't realistic, um, and absolutely wonderfully, no one thought it was undesirable. So. Uh, what we want to do now is, and I'll just close this because I think we're ready to move beyond that. Uh, let's do that. So what we, what we want to do is help us think through this question. And for those of you who actually do it pretty much, let's see if we can't help you do it even more rigorously and perhaps even more frequently. And it strikes me, and these are the four questions that I really want to focus on today is, if I'm not doing it as regularly and as rigorously as I, as I would like to, why aren't I? And it's, it's really important to understand why, we're not, why it's not working for us now, because that's going to help us um, overcome the challenges. And then, although this is a, probably a moot point given the results of the survey, we might just briefly talk about, so why bother? I mean, that's a lot of work to try to do this. Uh, there's a lot of other objectives to go uh, to develop. Why should, I, why should I put priority on this? And then I think the most useful and certainly the bulk of what we'll talk about today is, well, what would rigorous critical thinking look like? We all have understandings. We all have senses of what that would be. Um, but uh, what would it look like to do it really rigorously? So um, I, I don't know, Carol, uh, if you're still has a problem with closing out the question box, but we might uh, see if someone can help her with that advice. And um, the final question is, and the most practical of the questions, what are some things I can do to actually make sure that I can embed critical thinking, rigorous critical thinking into almost every lesson I do or virtually every lesson I do? 
But I want to start very briefly by explaining why, as a profession, we probably don't embed critical thinking as frequently as we probably would want to or I think we could. And to some extent, it's a legacy that has evolved from our use of Bloom's taxonomy. It's not that the original taxonomy was flawed, it's that we've used the taxonomy in a way unintended by Benjamin Bloom that has had the following effect. When we look at the taxonomy, we see knowledge and comprehension as the basis of all further thinking, and that the, uh, the taxonomy suggests that we have to master knowledge and comprehension of content before engaging in real thinking, application analysis evaluation. So let's just take a moment and say, so if this is the case, if this is the legacy of Bloom, what are the implications of Bloom for problem-based learning? What does that suggest? And I'd, I'd like to just pause for a moment and uh, let people perhaps answer in the chat box. Just give a few thoughts about what, so what does that mean? I'm a problem-based learning. I want the problem to be uh, embedded in my work. But if I take Bloom, what does that, how does that push me? Where, do, where does that um, move me towards? So I see a number of people are in the process of writing. So I'll just pause for a moment and, and get you to think about that. There's uh, evidence of people still writing, so we'll just uh, continue to pause for a, a moment longer. Uh, and while just we're waiting, if if people do have questions, I will I will monitor the chat box uh, as regularly as I can, so that uh, please feel free to to comment or raise a question, um, uh, and I'll I'll try to pick it up. So one implication is that we flip the pyramid. We put evaluation at the bottom, and, and that's what drives all of our work. Uh, interestingly enough, Sam Weinberg of Stanford University has proposed that. Um, others talk about, well, the need for knowledge before we can move uh, to the higher uh, order thinking. Um, so there's an assumption that you can't do evaluation unless you've laid on the content. Um, so there needs to be a, a knowledge established before the project can really get going. Uh, others talk about the value of engaging students as a way of deepening their understanding. And that's a big part of what I want to talk to you today. I won't be a good critical thinker if I don't know anything, but it's an open question about whether teaching me all these facts without purpose, without context, without engagement is actually a good way to get me to think about them. So what we want to propose is maybe we can actually acquire comprehension and knowledge. We can acquire the tools, the things we need to know through critical thinking, through evaluation, so that we don't have to hold off thinking while we transmit information but that we can actually uh, engage students in evaluation as they learn so that they don't have to, quote unquote, hold their breath until the end of the project when the real thinking occurs. So I want to just very briefly, because I think this is speaking to the converted here, why we would want this bigger role, why we would want to use critical thinking as the way of trying to teach comprehension, analysis, um, uh, knowledge. Well, one, it's more engaging. Uh, regurgitation of information is boring, and many students will tell us that frequently. Uh, we often use this as a, as a test case. Imagine uh, inviting students to uh, pick one of two options. Option A is to read the, pa the three paragraphs from the book or the worksheet or activity sheet, and to answer five comprehension questions uh, that follow. Option B is to read not three paragraphs, but four paragraphs, and tell, tell the teacher which one of these four paragraphs is bogus, because the teacher took three legitimate paragraphs 
and, and added a fourth paragraph that was doctored and that students would now have to figure out by reading carefully all of the work, which one was, was false, which one was inconsistent, which one was um, uh, not plausible given the other information. Most teachers we talk to have no trouble uh, suggesting that kids, that most of their ch students would select the, the additional paragraph and, and take the four, reading the four paragraphs because it's more interesting to do. The other thing, of course, is think of how much better they will understand uh, the content that we've just given. If instead of answering a comprehension question, which we must remember students often don't really read carefully, they just look for key words, as opposed to actually having to suss through the various uh, statements to see which one actually um, was consistent with others. So the, the content would be more deeply understood if they had to work through these. We've had wonderful examples of students who were asked to memorize formulas in mathematics and would forget them year after year, whereas in asked to create the formula by giving them uh, samples to think about where they came to understand and remember it better. And the final reason, at least that I want to share briefly with you uh, about critical thinking is that if we think we can promote good critical thinkers by turning it on at the, at the end of a unit, uh, we're making a big mistake. Critical thinking is fundamentally a habit, a way of being in a classroom or being in the world. And if we do a lot of front end loading and then later on ask students to think, we are undermining their inclination, their, in effect, their ability to be good critical thinkers. So if we do it rarely, we're not doing a good job of promoting it. But I think most of us here are already aware of that. So the, the, the meat of the work I want to do today with you is to help us uh, deepen our understanding, refine our understanding, because our experience, and now we've worked with virtually about 120,000 teachers across uh, Canada, North America, and, um, and Asia, is that we all understand critical thinking to some extent, but we may not necessarily understand it as, as precisely as would be helpful. So in the spirit of not telling you answers, but inviting you to think about answers, I'd like you to take a moment to look at the the, th the three kinds of questions, so the questions in column one, the questions in column two, the questions in column three. And I want to just get us thinking about what critical thinking might look like by trying to recognize what are the, what are the features or, di or features that differentiate column one questions from column two, what are the features that differentiate two from three. And then to think for a moment, what exactly uh, are the features that would be embedded, embedded in whatever questions we think are critical thinking questions? What, uh, which, one, which ones of these questions invite critical thinking? So I'm delighted to see that people are already uh, writing away. Um, so just take a moment and perhaps even just some one word answers, like what, what are some of the key features in one? What, what is uh, a, a, a sentence or less than a sentence about what seems to be uh, operating with number two? What makes number three different from number two? What is the salient feature around that? And we'll just wait to receive a, a collection of these answers. Um, before uh, moving on. Okay, so wonderful answers, and I encourage you to continue to write, and I encourage you to listen as I pick up some of the threads, and also to um, to read through some of the uh, the comments that people have mentioned. But I, I want to just make a, a point in passing that there's two purposes for uh, me asking you to do this. One is to um, is to share your thoughts with others, but also asking people to think and to formulate their own thoughts 
before hearing others is an important habit that if we get kids doing more regularly will induce their own thinking. So getting them more comfortable formulating their own opinions first. So clearly column one questions are factual questions and as is, is often used in, in, in uh, PBL talk, it's Googleable. Um, we often call these where's Waldo questions because the key feature about these questions is that the answer already exists somewhere out there. You just have to find it. The answer is there to be found. You don't have to think about it, which is why as a learning device, it's not a very powerful learning uh, pedagogy because you don't have to digest the information. You simply largely locate it. All right. So it's not that we don't care about facts, but as a learning strategy, it's not a good question. The second uh, column is moving more towards getting people to think, getting students to think. But we need to contrast that question with column three questions. So what's the difference between two and three? Well, often people use the word opinion, that people say, well, column two is an opinion question. And we often ask students, you know, we want your own opinion. We want you to give your own opinion. But many students will think a column three question is also an opinion. So if I, in answering the first question, uh, the first, um, the PBL question in column three, I might say, well, yes, in my considered opinion, every student ought to be expected to undertake PBL learning. Every student. So in my opinion. So what's the difference between, oh, yes, I love, I mean, I, I just love PBL. It's wonderful. That's my opinion. But both of those are my opinion. And what we'll notice is that when we present students with a question, half the class will interpret it as a column two question, and the other half will interpret it as a column three question. And we are often not clear who has done what. So what is the difference? A column two question has no wrong answer. It is simply a matter of you describing how you personally feel about something. So if you're a wonderful risk taker and you're reckless and foolish and carefree, you will join Columbus on anything he does. If you're cautious and, um, and nervous and a homebody, you're not going to go. And it's not like one answer is wrong and the other answer is right. We've asked you, what do you like? And you've said, yes, I like it or no, I don't like it. It's not the kind of thing that we can question, that we can debate. It's simply you've told us what you what you like. You've described your feelings. But notice when we're asking a column three question, we we want more than how do you feel about it. We want you to tell us whether it's a good idea or to put another word. And I notice people have used it. We want you to judge or assess the merits. I, I know um, I know you'd love to be the mayor of a city, but is this wise for you so you can it, it's one thing to tell me what you hope you can do. It's another thing to tell me what is a reasonable option for you to do. Or to put another, another way of describing this, in column three, we're asking people to make reasoned judgments supported with evidence. Now, I can give, I can give evidence. Would I have joined Columbus on his journey? Yes. Oh, because I did this and I did. I can give reasons why I think I would do this but it doesn't justify that it's a wise thing for me to do. So the key thing that determines rigorous critical thinking, evidenced by the questions in column three, are that students are making a reasoned judgment. And in our view, a reasoned judgment has three elements. That they, that they know the job is not to simply describe their feelings, but actually to assess uh, the issue and that they must assess each of the options available to them, and they must do that in light of criteria. So it's not simply, oh, I want to do it. They're doing it in light of reasonable criteria, which is why critical thinking gets its name. Critical thinking is thinking in the face of criteria. So I know I want to be mayor, but is it a wise choice? Well, what factors should someone use when deciding whether to be a mayor? Will I be good at it? Will, will it allow me to have the lifestyle I want? Those are the criteria or factors uh, that, that a reasonable person would consider. So critical thinking 
is criterial thinking. They share the same root word, which means that students or anyone is, is consciously considering what factors are relevant and using the assessment in light of those factors as the determination of their answer. So if we go back to our slide, should PBBL be required learning for all students? We're not asking you, do you like, do you support PBL? We're asking, is, is PBL an effective and important learning approach? We now want you to tell us, well, what factors ought we to decide? Well, will it engage students? Will it teach them important skills? Um, is it, is it, does it allow us to address the content of the curriculum? Those would be the criteria to use in judging whether, will it fit all students' needs? Those would be the criteria for, for judging whether this answer was um, a reasonable answer or not. So let's just take a moment um, and see if we understand the concept. So I'd like you, and we won't use the poll, but could you please just indicate with a yes or no whether uh, this question is a critical thinking question? Or to put another way, I want you to think critically whether this question meets the three criteria that I've laid out for a critical challenge. Does it require that the person uh, assess? Is there implicit or explicit options that the student, uh, that the person is assessing among? And is there criteria that, that would be available to use in that? So is question one, so just write uh, yes or no, perhaps, um, uh, for whether you think this is a critical thinking question. Is this a column three question? Just literally a one, a type in a, a, a yes or a no for... So I wonder, can you see all of the... Well, let me put up all of them, okay. Um, just in the interest of... Oh, I'm, I hadn't scrolled down, that's why we're... No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Great. You've got it. Let's do number two. Which theory explaining climate change is the most plausible? Now, you can see the difference and you can see the relationship. The factual question is the column one. What theories are there? Well, we want to ask that, but that's not getting students thinking deeply about it. Now, the, the critical thinking version of that is, now, which one of, of these is the most plausible? Let's, let's ask you to vote on call, uh, question three. How many of you think that question three is a critical thinking question? Yes or no? Okay, uh, I'm getting <laughs> a clear sense. Uh, this is a pretty sharp group. Um, so notice, notice the difference between question three and four. Question four is, which is the most cost-effective, reliable, and environmentally friendly energy source, as opposed to, if you could build your dream home, what energy source would you use? Now, many students, if they were answering that, would turn it into question four. They would say, well, yeah, my dream home, okay, so I want it to be cost effective, I want to be able to depend on it, and I care about the environment, so I'm going to do it. So they would treat column three, they would convert it into judging which option would best meet relevant factors. But the other half of the class will simply say, oh yeah, it'd be great to have nuclear energy and we could build a solar tower here and we could do this and they're simply giving a wish list of things that are not reliable necessarily certainly not cost effective and who knows whether they're environmentally friendly so that's how we we bring rigor to opinion by insisting and urging students to consider the criteria so you will often notice that um, that the buck institute uses is it googleable and that clearly eliminates the column one kind of question. It's not simply a factual question. But what's sometimes misleading is whether it's a opinion question, and by that I mean a mere opinion question as opposed to a reason judgment question. Uh, let's actually move ahead just because I think um, we, we're making good progress and you're understanding the concepts. What I now want to say is that 
we can convert many factual questions, many opinion questions into critical thinking questions without radically altering what we're asking simply by making sure that the judgment is explicit. So instead of asking the students to compare and contrast something, we may now ask them to say, okay, I understand um, here are the two objects to compare and contrast. Are these differences or similarities significant? Would they make a material uh, difference in the way, the, the way people live their lives? So let's say we were comparing two cities. Uh, Vancouver, where I, I live, is rainy. Um, San Francisco, or let's say Los Angeles, is not rainy. Is that a big difference in the, the, the way people live their lives to can, conduct uh, and, and are, you know, operate in the, in the world? Well, absolutely, because it changes the climate, it changes the outdoor occupations, it changes the vegetation, it changes what you can grow, it changes whether you need to bring in water, etc. So we would invite students as they're comparing to make judgments about the significance of this. And notice how much more meaningful in terms of understanding it is when instead of simply noting they have rain, we don't have rain, they're actually noting whether that's material, whether that's a substantive difference. Or similarly, um, you know, list the five causes, five, find the five causes is a factual question. Now rank order those in terms of their importance, assess which one is most important in terms of bringing about this event. Instead of simply find key ideas in a, in a, in a, uh, a document, we could now uh, give them misleading information and they had to sort out, judge which ones of these are plausible, which ones aren't. Instead of remembering a definition, we can ask them to uh, identify the attributes uh, that will help us define something. And let me just explain that by looking at the next slide. So we could teach math concepts, and in fact, this is an approach we use. Rather than giving students the definition of a parent function, we give students examples of a parent function, and we give them non-examples of a parent function. And based on that, they have to tease out the attributes of, of the, the various uh, concepts. I use that strategy in a, in a modified form when I gave you the column one, the column two, and the column three questions. I asked you to identify the features that distinguished column one from two and vice versa, and then use that as the basis to develop a definition of critical thinking as judging among options in light of criteria. So we're using the same strategy here in mathematics. I now want to come back to Bloom and to show how this same structure can be used to tweak uh, every kind of question in Bloom's taxonomy. So I've listed down the left-hand side um, one version of Bloom's taxonomy. The, this one puts uh, creativity at the, at the apex. Um, the original version put uh, evaluation at the apex. In the middle column, I have actually adapted from uh, a published resource used by teachers um, involving Goldilocks, uh, so a, a primary uh, unit where they identified the kinds of questions that they would ask students at each level. And what I've done in the red is show how we can bump up each question, not substantially altering what we're asking kids to think about. We're just asking them to think critically about it. So instead of describe where Goldilocks lived, so a student just goes and finds three pieces of information. Well, it was in a house, it was blue, and it was this or simply um, treating it as describing what they feel like describing about it. Well, I'll describe uh, how tall it was, but I won't describe where it was. So that it's just a matter of whimsy or, or preference, what they include. We give them, uh, we frame it in a way where we give them criteria and options to choose. So you must think of the words you would use, uh, words that involve visual, um, impressions as well as sensorial feeling impressions and which would be uh, those words that would really evoke that they would be strong evocative words so the cry so think of all the words you could use that are both visual and and feeling which would be the most the most evocative the most accurate and the most uh, enriching that i would really have a sense of what it would be like 
Um, so we've now created a critical thinking task out of what could have been uh, just simply remember something from the story or select the five most important details or apply, not just come up with a theory, but come up with a theory that is believable and based on clues in the story. So we've, we've, we've taken that task and we've induced some, in, introduced some rigor into the question by using our template of options among, um, judging among options in light of criteria. Um, so I see lots of, of conversation and I'm afraid I'm not gonna be able to pick up on uh, much of that, but um, I do encourage you to uh, carry on. I want to pick up on a point um, that I've alluded to before, and that it is to some extent also a legacy of Bloom, um, at least the way Bloom has been understood. There's a strong sense that if you get the right words, you're pretty well guaranteed to evoke a particular kind of thinking. So that if, and, and these are three examples of lovely, a lovely um, uh, driving questions that come from, you know, examples that the Buck Institute has used. I think these are all really challenging and interesting uh, questions I would, I would love to involve my students in. But I wanna, I wanna just draw a point is that it's not enough that we frame it in a way we have to make sure that students unpack it in a way in which we had intended. Or to put it another word, another way, I could present each of these three questions to students and some of them may actually treat it as a factual question. Others may treat it as a preference or mere opinion, personal preference uh, question, and still others may treat it as a reason judgment. So we need to make sure that that the question has in its or in its in its in its form formulation a strong likelihood of inducing this, but we also have to make sure that the students actually know how to unpack it in a way that does justice to that. So let me let me give you a scenario and ask you to think about um, uh, wh what kind of answer has a student given. So is this a fact? Is this a preference? Or is this a reason judgment? So when the student says, well, should DNA be used in criminal? I pick the answer that I like. Like, I, I, you know, I'm really in favor of DNA and science and that sort of stuff. Or sometimes it's not what I like. Sometimes it's, you know, I know the teacher really is a big, uh, you know, CI fan, you know, uh, so, so I do that. And then I just look up all the reasons I can find to support that position. What kind of answer has the student given us for that? So I see Debbie and others are writing, just give a, you know, is this, is this a reason judgment? Uh, it's the answer to the question, should D, DNA be used in criminal tests, uh, criminal things? So Andrew, I think, uh, and maybe it's too obvious too, but uh, I think the point is, is worth taking. Um, preference, etc. So column B, and, and these are not fanciful, unfortunately. I think these are, are uh, they're not common, but they're not uh, uh, completely rare. Here's a student, a, a student B's response to the same question. Oh, I, I, I've researched everything I could find, and then I summarize the reasons for the position that has the most number of reasons. So there's 10 reasons why, or that I understand them. So that, uh, yeah, I, I don't really understand that one, so I'm not gonna support that one, but I understand these and there's lots of these. What kind of answer? So uh, uh, a number of people correctly, they, they treat it as a, as a disguised form of a factual question. They don't ex assess the options. They actually just go out and do research and in some way that, isn't necessarily rigorous, they, they arrive at a conclusion, and then they just mobilize reasons to, to rationalize that side. But they haven't thought rigorously about it. What would it look like? And, and this you will notice for those of us who, who have used essays, you know, we get a lot of student A and student B in our essays, and that's what they do. What would it look like to actually support this question, which I think is a lovely, question. 
what would it look like to support a reasoned judgment? Uh, so can DNA be trusted in criminal trial? If we go back to judging among options in light of criteria, this will help us understand how this kind of structure is a very wide, very typical and, and useful format for helping students unpack a critical thinking question. We must get them to realize what the options are. And in the crudest terms, the options are, yes, it can be trusted, or no, it can't be trusted. Those are the most basic levels. We could, we could differentiate those options. It could be well trusted for um, particular kinds of, of evidence, but not for other kinds of evidence. So trusted in the case of identifying um, family origin, but not in, in identifying particular identity or something of that sort. So it could be trustable in certain contexts. So, but the options need to be understood. And then the next thing is students need to be clear about what criteria they would use to judge whether this was true or not. Well, can you apply DNA consistently? Or if, if six people were doing the testing, would you get six different results? Does it lead to a conclusive conclusion? It does, it, does it point out one person or does it, does it leave open the possibility of thousands of people? Is it easy to manipulate? So some, I mean, we, we know of people who, who burn their fingertips or, or mask their, their fingertips so their, their, um, uh, their um, oh, I've lost the term, the uh, fingerprint test doesn't work. So they, they've altered that. Uh, it, can we alter our DNA in ways that will be, be disruptable? Is it feasible? Does it, can we get it back in time? Can we get enough evidence? Um, and there are unique legal standards, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, et cetera. Does it meet those conditions? And those are just a quick brainstorm. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we want students, whether we did this collectively as a class or whether they did it individually, to be mindful. And now they would collect evidence um, in each of the blank uh, cells to figure out what evidence is there that it's consistent, what evidence is there that it isn't consistent. And once they'd assembled all this information, now they're ready to think critically about it. And uh, in effect, um, uh, this is what they should be invited to think about. And this describes a format we've used with, uh, in lieu of a debate where there's a sort of pro and con side, you're either for it or against it. We encourage students to, to position themselves, to think of themselves along a, a continuum. Now, if they were simply doing this in their essay, we could say, so on a continuum from DNA should be widely and highly trusted in every respect to DNA should be rarely, uh, completely disregarded in every respect. Where are you on this issue? In this case, students would, would organize themselves physically to have a discussion and a U-shape allows everyone to see everyone at once, but it's simply just uh, a line. And you notice, based on the information that students had collected, and there's no difficulty group collecting all of this information because we haven't given away the answer, now students could then uh, identify their particular position in an area and, um, and show and demonstrate their results and justify it in light of the criteria and the factors and what evidence they thought was reasonable, et cetera. So, this is the kind of structure, uh, now I've done it in a public way with the U-shaped discussion or simply on a continuum building on the, the data chart that they'd used. These, this would be a structure to increase the likelihood that students would have actually treated the wonderful question as a reasoned judgment. So I now just want to, to make sure we understand this point to ask this question. So, how would we ensure that students had followed through and treated each of these questions as a critical thinking question, because they're wonderful driving questions? What would we need to do? What would be the equivalent kind of unpacking that we would want in order to um, have this occur? Um, thank you, Lisa. I look forward to uh, talking later. Well. In the interest of, of just advancing the discussion, because uh, we want to wrap up within five or seven minutes, perhaps, um, 
we want to go back to judging among options in light of criteria. And we always want to start with the options. What are the options around why don't I fall off my skateboard? Well, we want students to think of what possible hypotheses are there. Is it because of my weight? Is it because of um, the adhesion on my feet? Is it because of gravitational pull or what? So they would, we would want them to think of possible theories that would explain that and then look at the evidence to support each theory in light of, of the criteria for a plausible theory. Well, if it's true, then it should explain why it does it. So it has explanatory power. There are no exceptions that we can't account for, so it's, it's consistent. Um, it explains all aspects, so it's a comprehensive theory. It explains all aspects of, of the problem, not just one. So uh, those would be the criteria. Similarly, when do we grow up? Well, what would be the options? Well, do we grow up when we become legally of age? Is it when we turn 20, uh, 21 or, or when we can drive a car or when we can uh, go to a bar or when we stop physically growing or when we stop mentally learning? I mean, what? so we would want students to think of the options and then to decide how do you recognize that someone is grown up? What would be the, what would be the criteria for there's a certain integrity, there's a certain independence. Those would be the kinds of factors that they would look at. And that's how they would unpack um, uh, each of these questions in the context of making sure that students treated them as critical thinking questions. Uh, I, want to, I want to actually uh, skip over this next part uh, only because it's, it's very useful, but it will uh, not, but it will, um, take us longer than I think we have time to do. And what I want to do is um, talk about what, would, what it would look like to scaffold questions uh, so that it wasn't just the driving question that was a critical thinking question, but many of the other activities that we did beforehand. And I just want to uh, run through an example for you that would give you um, uh, that sense of that. Um, so I, I, I appreciate, um, yeah, growing up on wh what criteria, wh wh what criteria do we decide when someone is, grows up? And that's, that, of course, will be absolutely crucial to making sure that the question gets treated as a critical thinking question. Um, and I notice some of you um, uh, need to leave. No, no apology necessary. Um, I'm, we're just delighted that you've been able to stay with us this long. We will, uh, we will be closing uh, within six minutes. Um, I want one example and then just some final comments. So let's, let's now look at an example of how we could, and we call it cascading challenges, so that there's a, there's a driving question and then that there's a sequence of subsequent questions all of which are critical thinking questions. So as students are filling in the needs to know, they're doing it in a critical thinking way. Now, I have tried to do this um, in, a, in a very modest way in this workshop. Rep at strategic parts, I gave you a critical thinking question to fill in some of the needs to know. Now, we didn't do it as much as we'd want just because um, it's hard uh, in this medium with this amount of time to, to defend the time, but, uh, but, but I've illustrated what that would look like. And I, I just want to illustrate what it would look like in your teaching situation with a, a sample unit that looks at, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an Aboriginal, it's an Indian uh, group on the west coast of Canada. Uh, but I, but I, I can imagine this kind of lesson could be done um, with other Aboriginal groups in, in the United States, and certainly uh, it can be widely mimicked in other contexts. But we wanted students, and this was a grade four unit, to think about before uh, Europeans came to North America and interacted with these people, did they have a great quality of life? Or were they basically twiddling their thumbs and holding their breath in anticipation of being liberated from an impoverished life? And so, because in effect, unfortunately, many students probably have that stereotype, is that life really didn't start for Aboriginal people until 
white people liberated them from their conditions. So that's the question, the driving question we wanted to use for our project-based learning. Now I want to quickly describe for you the way in which we scaffold the learning. So all of the content was learned through critical thinking questions, uh, leading to the culminating uh, performance at the end. Uh, so we started by giving them, now you can appreciate we used photographs which obviously happened after European contact, but these photographs were said to represent some fairly traditional patterns that pre-existed beforehand. As well, we found lots of drawings, uh, illustrations that, that, that had uh, existed at the time, so that we collected all these documents and we invited students initially because they, they would know so little about this, this group, just to try to figure out what these pictures uh, are saying to us. So we use the 5W strategy, who are these people? And with grade four, this was a challenge. But we asked them, we taught them some concepts, so a hypothesis and evidence, and we asked them to fill out as many of these questions, and we worked in groups uh, so that we could jointly come up with answers about what do you think they're doing? Uh, why do you think they're doing it? When does this take place? Is it in the summer, in the winter? Is it recently? Is it long ago, et cetera? And we spent a lot of time getting students to understand what these pictures were like. This slide has not translated well in, the, in our transition. Then what we had, because we had groups of students look at four or five pictures, we wanted to scaffold the learning and add to the background knowledge by asking one group to look at the, the analyses that another group had done and to decide how well their picture study, how well that other group had done a picture study. So did they, did they answer all the five questions? Was it complete? And students would give an assessment and give reasons. Uh, is there lots of evidence for their hypotheses? Do we have any questions or doubts about some of the hypotheses we've read? So notice, uh, this is a way of making purposeful an excuse to have students look at the other pictures and look at the other analysis and to do it in a critical thinking way by judging how good these, these other students had been able to um, summarize the pictures. And of course, led to lots of discussion about what, what was happening in these pictures. But notice, we're scaffolding critical inquiry or critical thinking at every step of the way. This took quite amount of time. And then we said, okay, now let's go back. Now that we understand what's going on in these pictures, these pictures can tell us a lot about the various aspects of the livelihood or quality of life of, of this group. So what was their shelter? What their food? What their clothing? So in this picture, I see this. My observation, my hypothesis is that they might, they made clothing out of, of straw. They made clothing out of, um, of sheepskin, of skins, sorry, etc. So they began to accumulate um, the evidence for a variety of these. And then we divided the group up into parts and said, you focus on shelter. Here's the criteria for effective shelter. You tell me how, how well the shelter, how well they met this requirement. And then the final overarching assessment is they had to reach their own conclusion based on the evidence that they had and they shared, one group shared the shelter, the other group shared food, etc. They had to come to an overall conclusion about what life was like for these groups. Um, and just so you know, uh, everyone realized that they certainly didn't have a very poor quality of life and various students differed whether it was pretty good so-so and many of course thought it was very good for, for obvious and important reasons. So I want to conclude and I've left so little time um, unfortunately to do this but are there any last minute uh, questions uh, so please post them and um, Maybe just revisit uh, the, the question, the driving question that we use for today's talk. Could I actually embed rigorous critical thinking into every lesson of my next PBL unit? Uh, and we don't need to vote on this or poll on this, but um, I hope some of you will have said, yes, I think it's now clear to me how I might be able to do that. And I guess uh, if needed, some of you, yes, and, and now I'm even more motivated to do that. Um, so I see uh, Lauren and others are answering questions. Um, where can we go for more examples? Um, our, um, the, the, the ideas I've shared with you 
form the basis of the work that our group has has worked with. And if you go to our website, and I've put it at the bottom of this page, uh, www.tc2.ca, you will find uh, there's quite an enormous website. Um, we're making it simpler so you can find the free examples. There are many, many free examples. We have collections of, of what we call critical challenge, critical thinking lessons in print form and online form that are available for purchase. But um, the short answer for free samples is if you go to any one of our publications and look it up, there's always a free lesson plan there for you to use. And every one of our other collections, there's always there's always a couple of free lessons uh, that you can use and look at. There are some free articles to read more about that. So those would be, um, how do you assess? Yes, uh, Melanie, that's, uh, that's the $64,000 question. Uh, and uh, we've done quite a bit of work around that. But let me, let me try to give you um, a very uh, quick answer. So uh, let's go back to should, um, should DNA be used in, in criminal trials? The traditional way to assess is you assess whether they got the right answer. The right answer is yes, okay? Well, that's not what we want to do, that you're not assessing the critical thinking. And, and hopefully, in a good PBL project, it's not obvious that there is a right answer. So that, that, that method of assessing a correct answer just doesn't fly. But let's imagine two examples, all right? A student who considers only one or two of the criteria and not all five or six that we've generated. So, so have you considered all the factors? That would be one of the ways in which we'd assess their answer. And we don't care whether they said it was, DNA was great or horrible. We just look to see whether they considered enough factors. We could look to see whether their evidence for each factor was relevant and accurate, right? Again, we're not, we're not uh, concluding uh, anything about their answer, but just but the quality of the reasoning behind the answer. Did they draw conclusions? They looked at the evidence and they said, this proves that DNA is reliable. Were the conclusions they've drawn plausible? The, 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 those would be the kinds of things that we could look at by uh, uh, using that structure that I shared with you to, to, to decide and, and it, notice uh, the student, a student could get A and thought, DNA was absolutely reliable. A student could get an A and say DNA is not reliable, uh, but it would be on the quality of the consideration of factors, the accuracy and relevance of the information, the plausibility of the conclusions. Now, it would be hard to argue that it's completely irrelevant if the body of evidence is quite compelling, but it's at least theoretically possible. Um, yes. Uh, uh, John and his team have recently, and I, I think it's in press, there's a new book coming out around 21st century learning and PBL, and there's a chapter in critical thinking that uh, uh, I have looked at that I think is very good. That would be another very useful source. Um, I, I am going to stay on and answer any other questions uh, that people have. Otherwise, I want to thank you for, for dropping in and... Uh, uh, look forward to uh, continued good work with PBL. Thank you, Roland. Thanks everyone for, for participating today. Uh, from the Buck Institute for Education, we wish you well and please stay in touch. Visit Roland's website or our own. And this webinar will, of course, be on our archive. About two more minutes for questions and then we'll uh, close the webinar. So uh, Andrew's question, um, I, Andrew's, oops, I'm, let me just make sure, <laughs> Andrew's been prolific, um, so let me see which one we're thinking of. Question, where can we get more cascading challenge? Oh, um, and turning factual questions into critical thinking tasks. Um, the part that we didn't cover today uh, we, we have developed six uh, question frames, or we call them prompts, uh, that uh, do just that, that tweak. Um, 
And uh, um, well, <laughs> John, maybe you'll have to have us back. Or uh, we offer um, some some webinars as well. Um, so there may be an opportunity uh, to do it that way. Um, in terms of samples for um, scaffolded, we we have developed a number of publications that are units, units of study, um, that that in effect use this approach. Although it's not not necessarily um, as sort of backwards design uh, in all cases as uh, as we might like. Sometimes they're uh, um, less less a PBL focus with a with a sort of driving continuous question, but but there are lots of examples in our print resources um, available. Um, so Shannon, uh, I'm not sure I understand your question, but um, if it's uh, using the collective wisdoms of students to build shared knowledge, we're absolutely a uh, hundred percent behind that, and what, which is sort of what I was alluding to uh, when I described that structure for the DNA and and um, and uh, criminal trials. That chart is something that we would hope that the whole class could do, either by bringing what they already know, doing independent research, and pulling it together, so that we actually build a lot of common knowledge, and we're not troubled that we're giving away the answer because the a good PBL question having the facts before you is is absolutely crucial but it doesn't solve the answer so so uh, doing everything we can to build shared understanding by building on what kids already know is is absolutely crucial um, uh, Shannon I don't know if that's your question but um, <laughs> John's cut us off, I guess. So, um, uh, you can email me at case c a s c at sfu dot ca if if I if you have a follow up question. All right, thanks, Roland. Uh, we'll uh, we'll be in touch. And uh, folks, if you have any questions, you can email Roland or email us or visit his website. Thanks very much. 